Clemens of Rome. Introductory note to the first epistle of Clemens to the Corinthians, A.D. 30 to A.D. 100. Clemens was probably a Gentile and a Roman. He seems to have been at Philippi with St. Paul, A.D. 57, when that firstborn of the Western churches was passing through great trials of faith. There, with holy women and others, he ministered to the apostle and to the saints. As this city was a Roman colony, we need not inquire how a Roman happened to be there. He was probably in some public service, and it is not improbable that he visited Corinth in those days. From the apostle and his companion, St. Luke, he had no doubt learned the use of the Septuagint in which his knowledge of the Greek tongue soon rendered him an adept. His copy of that version, however, does not always agree with the received text as the reader will perceive. A co-presbyter with Linus and Cletus, he succeeded them in the government of the Roman Church. I have reluctantly adopted the opinion that his epistle was written near the close of his life and not just after the persecution of Nero. It is not probable that Linus and Cletus both perished in that fierce trial and that Clemens' immediate succession to their work and place occasions the chronological difficulties of the period. After the death of the apostles for the Roman imprisonment and martyrdom of St. Peter seems historical. Clemens was the natural representative of St. Paul and even of his companion, the apostle of the circumcision, and naturally he wrote the epistle in the name of the local church when brethren looked to him for advice. St. John, no doubt, was still surviving at Patmos or in Ephesus, but the Philippines, Philippians, whose intercourse with Rome is attested by the visit of Aphroditus, looked naturally to the surviving friends of their great founder, nor was the aged apostle in the East equally accessible. All roads pointed towards the imperial city and started with its um, M-I-L-L-I-A-R-I-U-M and then A-U-R-E-U-M. But though Clement doubtless wrote the letter, he conceals his own name and puts forth the brethren who seem to have met in council and sent a brotherly delegation, chapter 49, the entire absence of the spirit of D-I-O-T-R-E-P-H-E-S, 3 John, verse 9, and the close accordancy of the, the epistle in humility and meekness with that of St. Peter, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, are noteworthy features. The whole will be found animated with the loving and faithful spirit of St. Paul's dear Philippians, among whom the writer had learned the gospel. Clement fell asleep probably soon after his dispatched his letter. It is the legacy of one who reflects the apostolist age in all the beauty and in evangelical truth which were the first fruits of the Spirit's presence with the church. He shares with others the aurora of glory attributed by St. Paul, Philippians 4.3. His name is in the book of life. The plan of this publication does not permit the restoration in this volume of the recently discovered portions of his work. It is the purpose of this editor to present this, however, with other recently discovered relics of primitive antiquity in a supplementary volume should the undertaking meet with sufficient encouragement. The so-called second epistle of Clemens is now known to be the work of another and has been regulated to another place in the series. The following is the introductory notice of the original editors and translators, Drs. Roberts and Donaldson. The first epistle bearing the name of Clemens has been preserved to us in a single manuscript only. Though very frequently referred to by ancient Christian writers, it remained unknown to the scholars of Western Europe until happily discovered in the Alexandrian manuscript. This MS of the sacred scriptures, known and generally referred to as Codex A, was presented in 1628 by Cyril, Patriarch of Constantinople to Charles I, and is now preserved in the British Museum. Subjoined to the books of the New Testament contained in it, there are two writings described as the epistles of one Clement. Of this, that now before us is the first, it is tolerably perfect, but there are many slight gaps in the manuscript, and one whole leaf is supposed to have been lost towards the close. This gap, however, so numerous in some chapters, do not generally extend beyond a word or syllable and can, for the most part, be easily supplied. Who the Clement was, to whom the, 
these writings are ascribed cannot with absolute certainty be determined. The general opinion is that he is the same as the person of the name referred to by St. Paul, Philippians 4.3. The writings themselves contain no statement as to their author. The first and by far the longer of them simply purports to have been written in the name of the church at Rome to the church at Corinth. But in the catalog of contents prefixed to the manuscript, they are both plainly attributed to one Clement, and the judgment of most scholars is that, in regard to the first epistle at least, this statement is correct, and that it is to be regarded as an authentic production of the friend and fellow worker of St. Paul. This belief may be traced to an earlier period in history of the church. It is found in the writings of Eucubus, uh, History of Ecclesiastes 3.15, of Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, Commentary in Jonathan 129, and others. The internal evidence also tends to support this opinion. The doctrine, style, and manner of thought are all in accordance with it, so that, although, as has been said, positive certainty cannot be reached on the subject, we may with great probability conclude that we have in this epistle a composition of that Clemens, who is known to us from Scripture as having been an associate of the great apostle. The date of this epistle has been the subject of considerable controversy. It is clear from the writing itself that it is composed soon after some persecution, chapter 1, which the Roman church had endured. And the only question is whether we are to fix upon the persecution under Nero or Dominic. If the former of the date would be about the year 68 to the latter, we must place it towards the close of the first century or the beginning of the second. We possess no external aid to the settlement of the question. The list of early Roman bishops are in hopeless confusion, some making Clemens the immediate successor of St. Peter. Others placing Linus and others still, Linus and Anacletus, between him and the apostle. The internal evidence, again, leaves the matter doubtful, though it has been strongly pressed on both sides. The probability seems on the whole to be in favor of the Dominic period, so that the epistle may be dated about AD 97. The epistle was held in great very esteem by the early church. The account given of it by Ichibus, uh, as as followed, there is one acknowledged epistle of the Clemens, whom he has just justified with the friend of St. Paul, great and admirable, which he wrote in the name of the Church of Rome at, to the church at Corinth, sedition having then arisen in the later church. We are aware of this epistle has been publicly read in very many churches, both in old times and also in our own day. The epistle before us thus appears to have been read in numerous churches as being almost on the level with the canonized writings, and its place in the Alexandrian manuscript immediately after the inspired books is in harmony with the position thus assigned to it in the primitive church. There does indeed appear a great difference between it and the inspired writings in many respects, such as the fanciful use sometimes made of the Old Testament statements, the fabulous stories, which are accepted by its author, and the general uh, diffusionness and feebleness of style by which it is distinguished. But the high tone of evangelical truth which pervades it, the simple and earnest appeals which makes to the heart and conscience the anxiety which its writer so constantly shows to promote the best interest of the Church of Christ, still impart an undying charm to this precious relic of the later apostles' times. End of the introductory note to the first epistle of Clemens to the Corinthians, having been read by Peter John Persis. The Church Fathers. The first epistle of Clemens to the Corinthians. Chapter 1, the salutation. Praise of the Corinthians before the breaking forth of the schism among them. The church of God, which sojourns at Rome, to the church of God sojourning at Corinth, to them that are called and sanctified by the will of God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you in peace, from Almighty God through Jesus Christ be multiplied. Owing, dear brethren, to the sudden and successive calamity events that have happened to ourselves, we feel that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points respecting which you consulted us, and especially to that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled to such a pith of frenzy, that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be universally loved, has suffered grievous injury. For whoever 
dealt even for a short time among you and did not find your faith to be as fruitful a virtue as it was firmly established, who did not admire the sobriety and the moderation of your godliness in Christ, who did not proclaim the magnificence of your habitual hospitality, and who did not rejoice over your perfect and well-grounded knowledge. For ye did all things without respect to persons, and walked in the commandments of God, being obedient to those who had the rule over you, and giving all fitting honor to the presbyters among you. Ye enjoined young men to be of a sober and serious mind. Ye instructed your wives to do all things with a blameless, becoming, and pure conscience, loving their husbands as in duty bound. And ye taught them that, living in the rule of obediency, they should manage their household affairs becomingly, and be in every respect marketed, marked by discretion. End of chapter 1, having been read by Peter John Persis. Ancient Fathers, uh, Anthony uh, Nyson, Volume 1, Chapter 2, Praise of the Corinthians Continued. Moreover, ye were all distinguished by humility, and were in no respect puffed up of pride, but yielded obediency rather than extorted it, and were more willing to give than to receive. Content with the provision which God had made for you, and carefully attending to his words, ye were inwardly filled with his doctrine, and his sufferings were before your eyes. Thus a profound and abundant peace was given to you all, and ye had an insatiable desire for doing good, while a full outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon you all. Full of holy designs, ye did, with true earnestness of mind and godly confidence, stretch forth your hands to God Almighty, beseeching him to be merciful unto you, if ye had been guilty of any involuntary transgression. Day and night ye were anxious for the whole brotherhood, that the number of God's elect might be saved with mercy and a good conscience. Ye were sincere and uncorrupted, and forgetful of injuries between one another. Every kind of fraction and schism was abominable in your sight. Ye you mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors, their deficiencies you deemed your own. You never grudged any act of kindness, being ready to every good work, adorned by a thoroughly virtuous and religious life. He did all things in the fear of God. The commandments and ordinances of the Lord were written upon the tablets of your heart. End of chapter 2 have been read by Peter John Persis. Church Fathers, Volume 1, Clemens, Chapter 3, The Sad State of the Corinthian Church, after sedition arose in it from envy and emulation. Every kind of honor and happiness was bestowed upon you, and then was fulfilled that which is written, My beloved did eat and drink, and was enlarged and became fat, and kicked. Hence flowed emulation and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and disorder, war and captivity. So the worthless rose up against the honored, those of no reputation against such as were renowned, the foolish against the wise, the young against those advanced in years. For this r reason, righteousness and peace are now far departed from you, inasmuch as everyone abandons the fear of God, and has become blind in his faith, neither walks in the ordinances of his appointment, nor acts apart becoming a Christian, but walks after his own wicked lust, resuming the practice of an unrighteous and ungodly envy, by which death itself entered into this world. End of chapter 3, having been read by Peter John Parises. Church Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 4. Many evils have already flowed from this source in ancient times. For thus it is written, And it came to pass after certain days that Cain brought of the fruits of the earth to sacrifice unto God, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his sheep, and of the fat thereof. And God had respect to Abel and to his offerings. But Cain and his sacrifices he did not regard. And Cain was greatly, deeply grieved, and his countenance fell. And God said to Cain, Why art thou grieved, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou offerest rightly, but dost not divide rightly. Hast thou not sinned? Be at peace, thine offering returns to thyself, and thou shalt again possess it. And Cain said to Abel his brother, 
let us go into the field. And it came to pass while they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Ye see, brethren, how envy and jealousy led to the murder of a brother. Through envy, also, our father Jacob fled from the face of Esau, his brother. Envy made Joseph be persecuted unto death and to come into bondage. Envy compelled Moses to flee from the face of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, when he heard these words from his fellow countrymen, who made thee a judge a ruler over us. Wilt thou kill me as thou didst kill the Egyptian yesterday? On account of envy. Aaron and Miriam had to make their abode without the camp. Envy brought down Dathan and Abiam, alive in Hades, through the sedition which they excited against God's servant Moses. Through envy, David underwent the hatred, not only of foreigners, but was also persecuted by Saul, king of Israel. End of chapter 4, have been read by Peter John Parisius. The Ancient Church Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 5. No less evils have arisen from the same source in the most recent times, the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. But not to dwell upon ancient examples, let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Let us take the noble examples furnished in our own generation. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance, after being seven times thrown into captivity. Footnote, seven imprisonments of St. Paul are not referred to in Scripture. End of footnote. Compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both in the East and West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the West, and suffered martyrdom under the prefix. Thus was he removed from the world, and went into a holy place, have improved himself a striking example of patience. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 6 Continuization, Several Other Martyrs To these men who spent their lives in the practice of holiness, there is to be added a great multitude of the elect, who having through envy endured many indignities and tortures, furnished us with the most excellent example. Through envy, those women, the Danates and uh, D-I-R-C-A-E, being persecuted after they had suffered terrible and unspeakable tortures, finished the course of their faith with steadfastness, and the weakened body received a noble reward. Envy was alienated wives from their husbands and changed that saying of our father Adam, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Envy and strife have overthrown great cities and rooted up mighty nations. End of chapter 6. Ancient Church Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 7. An Exhortation to Repentancy. These things, beloved, we write unto you, not merely to admonish you of your duty, but also to remind ourselves. For we are struggling on the same arena, and the same conflict is assigned to both of us. Wherefore, let us give up vain and fruitless cares, and approach to the glorious and venerable rule of our holy calling. Let us attend to what is good, pleasing, and acceptable in the sight of Him who formed us. Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ, and see how precious that blood is to God, which, having been shed for our salvation, has set the grace of repentancy before the whole world. Let us turn to every age that has passed, and learn that, from generation to generation, the Lord has granted a place of repentancy to all such as would be converted unto Him. Noah preached repentancy, and as many as listened to him were saved. Jonah proclaimed destruction to the Ninevites, but they, repenting of their sin, propitiated God by prayer and obtained salvation, although they were aliens to the covenant of God. End of chapter 7. Have been read by Peter John Priestess. The Ancient Church Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 8, Continuation, Respecting Repentancy. The ministers of the grace of God have, by the Holy Spirit, spoken of repentancy, and the Lord of all things has himself declared with an oath regarding it. As I live, saith the Lord, I desire not the death of the sinner, 
but rather his repentancy. Adding, moreover, this gracious declaration, Repent, O house of Israel, of your iniquity. Say to the children of my people, Though your sins reach from heaven to earth, and though they be redder than scarlet, and blacker than sackcloth, yet if ye turn to me with your whole heart and say, Father, I will listen to you, as to a holy people. And in another place he speaks thus, Wash you and become clean. Put away the wickedness of your souls from before mine eyes. Cease from your evil ways and learn to do well. Seek out judgment, deliver the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and see that justice is done to the widow. And come, let us reason together. He declares, Though your sins be like crimson, I will make them white as snow. Though they be like scarlet, I will whiten them like wool. And if ye be willing and obey me, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and will not hearken unto me, the sword shall devour you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken these things. Desiring, therefore, that all his beloved should be partakers of repentancy, he has, by his almighty will, established these declarations. End of chapter 8. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1. Chapter 9. Examples of the Saints. Wherefore, let us yield obediency to his excellent and glorious will, and employing his mercy and loving kindness, while we forsake all fruitless labors and strife and envy, which leads to death, let us turn and have recourse to his compassions. Let us steadfastly contemplate those who have perfectly ministered to his excellent glory. Let us take, for instance, Enoch, who, being found righteous in obediency, was translated, and death was never known to happen to him. Noah, being found faithful, preached regeneration to the world through his ministry, and the Lord saved by him the animals which, with one accord, entered into the ark. End of chapter 9. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 10, Continuization of the Above. Abraham, styled the friend, was found faithful inasmuch as he rendered obediency to the words of God. He, in the exercise of obediency, went out from his own country and from his kindred and from his father's house in order that, by forsaking a small territory and a weak family and an insignificant house, he might inherit the promises of God. For God said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into the land which I shall show thee. And I will make thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be blessed. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And again, on his departing from Lot, God said to him, Lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou now art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, into thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And again, the scripture saith, God brought forth Abram, and spake unto him, Look up now to heaven, and count the stars, if thou art able to number them. So shall thy seed be. And Abram believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. On account of this faith and hospitality, a son was given him in his old age, and in the exercise of obediency, he offered him as a sacrifice to God on one of the mountains which he showed him. End of chapter 10. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 11. Continues this Lot. On account of his hospitality and godliness, Lot was saved out of Sodom, when all the country round was punished by means of fire and brimstone, the Lord thus making it manifest that he does not forsake those that hope in him, but gives up such as depart from him to punishment and torture. For Lot's wife, who went forth with him, being of a different mind from himself, and not continuing in agreement with him as to the command which had been given them, was made an example of, so as to be a pillar of salt unto this day. This was done that all might know that those who are of a double mind and who distrust the power of God bring down judgment on themselves and become a sign to all succeeding generations. End of chapter 11. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 12, The Rewards of Faith and Hospitality. Rahab, on account of her faith and hospitality, Rahab the harlot was saved. For when spies were sent by Joshua, the son of Nun, to Jericho, the king of the country asserted 
that they were come to spy out their land, and sent men to seize them, in order that, when taken, they might be put to death. But the hospitable Rahab, receiving them, concealed them on the roof of her house, under some stalks of flax. And when the men sent by the king arrived, and said, There came men unto thee, who are to spy out our land, bring them forth, for so the king commands. She answered them, The two men whom ye seek came unto me, but quickly departed again, and are gone. Thus not discovering the, the spies to them. Then she said to the men, I know assuredly that the Lord your God hath given you this city, for the fear and dread of you have fallen all on its inhabitants. When therefore ye shall have taken it, keep ye me in my house of my father in safety. And they said to her, It shall be as thou hast spoken to us. As soon therefore as thou knowest that we are at hand, thou shalt gather all thy family under thy roof, and they shall be preserved. But all that are found outside of thy dwelling shall perish. Moreover, they gave her a sign to this effect, that she should hang forth from her house a scarlet thread. And thus they made it manifest that redemption should flow through the blood of the Lamb to all them that believe and hope in God. See ye, beloved, that there, are, there was not only faith, but prophecy in this woman. End of chapter 12. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1. Chapter 13, An Exhortation to Humility. Let us therefore, brethren, be of a humble mind, laying aside all haughtiness and pride and foolishness and angry feelings, and let us act according to that which is written. For the Holy Spirit saith, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, neither let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in the Lord, and diligently seeking him, and doing judgment and righteousness being especially mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, which he spake, teaching us meekness and long-suffering. For thus he spoke, Be ye merciful, that ye may obtain mercy, obtain mercy. Forgive, that it may be forgiven to you. As ye do, so shall it be done unto you. As ye judge, so shall ye be judged. As ye are kind, so shall kindness be shown to you. With what measure ye might, with the same, it shall be measured to you. By this precept and by these rules, let us establish ourselves that we walk with all humility and obediency to his holy words. For the holy word saith, On whom shall I look, but on him that is meek and peaceable, and that trembleth at my words? Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 14. We should obey God rather than the authors of sedition. It is right and holy, therefore, men and brethren, rather to obey God than to follow those who, through pride and sedition, have become the leaders of a detestable immolation. For we shall incur no slight injury, but rather great danger, if we rashly yield ourselves to the inclinations of men who aim at exciting strife and tumults, so as to draw us away from what is good. Let us be kind one to another after the pattern of a tender mercy and the of our Creator. For it is written, The kind-hearted shall inherit the land, and the guiltless shall be left upon it. But transgressors shall be destroyed from off the face of it. And again, the scripture saith, I saw the ungodly highly exalt exalted and lifted up like the cedars of Lebanon. I passed by, and behold, he was not. I diligently saw his place and could not find it. Preserve innocence and look on in equity, for there shall be a remnant to the Peaceful Man. End of chapter 14. The Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 15. We must adhere to those who cultivate peace, not to those who merely pretend to do so. Let us cleave, therefore, to those who cultivate peace with godliness, and not to those who hypocritically profess to desire it. For, the scripture saith in a certain place, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And again, they bless with their mouth, but curse with their heart. And again, it saith, they loved him with their mouth, and lied to him with their tongue. But their heart was not right with him, neither were they faithful in his covenant. Let the deceitful lips become silent, and let the Lord destroy all the lying lips. And the boastful tongue of those who have said, let us magnify our tongue, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. 
for the oppression of the poor and for the sign of the needy will I now arise, saith the Lord. I will place him in safety. I will deal confidently with him. End of chapter 15. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 16. Christ as an example of humility. For Christ is of those who are humble-minded, and not of those who exalt themselves over his flock. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the scepter of the majesty of God, did not come in the pomp of pride or arrogancy, although he might have done so, but in a lowly condition, as the Holy Spirit had declared regarding him. For he says, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We have declared our message in his presence. He is, as it were, a child, and like a root in thirsty ground. He has no form nor glory. Yea, we saw him, and he had no form nor comeliness. But his form was without eminency, yea, deficient in comparison with the ordinary form of men. He is a man exposed to stripes and suffering, and acquainted with the endurance of grief. For his countenance was turned away. He was despised and not esteemed. He bears our iniquities, and is in sorrow for our sakes. Yet we suppose that, on his own account, he was exposed to labor and stripes and afflictions. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every man has wandered in his own way, and the Lord has delivered him up for our sins, while he, in the midst of his sufferings, openeth not his mouth. He was brought as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. For the transgressions of my people was he brought down to death. And I will give the wicked for his scepter and the rich for his death. Because he did no iniquity, neither was guile found in his mouth. And the Lord is pleased to purify him by stripes. If you make an offering for sin, your soul shall see a long-lived seed. And the Lord is pleased to relieve him of the affliction of his soul, to show him light, and to form him with understanding, to justify the just one, who ministers well to many, and he himself shall carry our, their sins. On this account he shall inherit many, and shall divide the spoil of the strong, because his soul was delivered to death, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and for their sins was he delivered. And again he said, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All that see me have deriled me, they have spoken with their lips, they have wagged their heads, saying, He hoped in God, let him deliver him, let him save him, since he delighted in him. You see, beloved, what is the example which has been given us? For if the Lord thus humbled himself, what shall we do who have through him come under the yoke of his grace? End of chapter 16. Ancient Fathers, Volume 1, Chapter 17. The Saints and Examples of Humility. Let us be imitators also of those who in goat skins and sheep skins went about proclaiming the coming of Christ. I mean Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, among the prophets, with those others to whom a like testimony is born in Scripture. Abraham was especially honored and was called the friend of God. Yet he, earnestly regarding the glory of God, humbly declared, I am but dust and ashes. Moreover, it is thus written of Job. Job was a righteous man and blameless, truthful, God-fearing, and one that kept himself from all evil. But bringing an accusation against himself, he said, No man is free from defilement, even if his life be but one day. Moses was called faithful in all God's house. And through his instrumentality, God punished Egypt with plagues and tortures. Yet he, though thus greatly honored, did not adopt lofty language, but said, when the divine oracle came to him out of the bush, Who am I that thou sentest me? I am a man of a feeble voice and a slow tongue. 
And again he said, I am but as the smoke of a pot. End of chapter 17.